Now that we've captured all of the rise times for the various capacitors, um, C0 being the oscilloscope probe, and C1, C2, C3, and C4 being the um, four random capacitors I grabbed out of my bit bucket. Um, I've plugged all of the values into this Excel spreadsheet. We'll go through it in just a moment. And also the same thing for the inductors. I had three inductors in the video, L1, 2, and 3. Um, I've also added an L4 because um, I actually found the one that uh, the large loop that I showed you and we measured um, was supposed to be replacing for a cat flap. The idea of the big one is the cats can walk right through the middle of the loop and the RFID tag should be detected and allow it to open the flap. Um, haven't got that project finished yet but I wanted to just show you. So L4 was the original RFID uh, inductor coil that was uh, sent along with the chip that does the decoding and uh, I worked out that I was nowhere near the value that I needed so I got some more winding to do on the coil nevertheless it's all here so what I've done is here's the spreadsheet set up um, these are the various capacitors I've done it in ohms so that we just keep the math as close to the standard as possible so we've got the 100k resistors for C0, C1 uh, we've got the 10K as well for C1, if you remember we did that twice with two different resistors. And then we have the 10K for C2 and a 1K for C3 and C4. For the inductors, we just chose to use, I believe, C2, um, which is the little blue one. And uh, we use that for when we did all of our inductor measurements. So at the point we did it, we hadn't calculated the value of the capacitor. So I've just linked that across right from here in the formula. So anyway, uh, each of the inductors had a frequency that we measured. So 132 kilohertz, 22 kilohertz, 29 kilohertz, and 20 kilohertz. Um, in the case of the inductors, W that is shown here is actually the part of the formula um, which is effectively 2 pi f all squared okay so pi being 3.14159 and d12 is the frequency that we measured um, from that which is most of the formula we can then do the calculation for the uh, actual inductance in Henry's um, which is basically 1 over the W factor multiplied by the capacitance which as you can see from here if I highlight this it's using C2 okay um, the micro Henry's is simply the Henry's multiplied by um, 1 million to get it from Henry's to micro Henry's because this is obviously uh, a much more usable value uh, and what things are commonly uh, given in micro Henry's for inductors um, for the capacitors, it's uh, the math is much, much more straightforward. We capture the rise time. We know the resistor. We know that the rise time was 63%. So we can simply do the rise time divided by the resistance. And that gives us a calculated capacitance. Uh, CDMM is the capacitance I measured putting the um, capacitor into my Agilent U1272A multimeter so that I could get a reference point. Uh, it's accurate to within um, a percent or two for most ranges of capacitors. Uh, the one that deviated for some reason is actually the scope probe tip but I think that's because it's more than just a simple capacitor on that scope probe so it may be depending on the frequency from the Agilent um, and other factors that might be throwing off the reading compared to what we got with the actual um, pulse check. And then for the capacitors that actually did have markings on them, um, I've written down what the markings said as well. So we've got a couple of 10 nanofarads, 100 nanofarad, sorry, we've got one 10 nanofarad, which was this C1, we've got two tests for it, 100 nanofarad, a 4.7 microfarad, and a 1,000 microfarad. So um, with all that, what we ended up with is, as you can see here, for the measured values using the mathematics and measuring the rise times, we actually got pretty close to the um, readings from the digital multimeter. So if you take something like C1, 
um, in both cases 1.16, 1.17 um, to the minus 8 which works out to be uh, 11 nanofarads or just over 11 almost 12 on the multimedia multimeter it was reading 11 nanofarads for C2 we were getting the 100 nanofarads or 9.8394 either minus 8 um, and the multimeter read 97 uh, nanofarads whereas we had 98 so that's pretty good for um, you know, a low resolution oscilloscope um, with a high resolution pulse from the Agilent um, I think that's close enough for anybody would be happy with that kind of reading and then the final capacitors of course uh, in the microfarad ranges so the multimeter read 5.54 the uh, rise time gave us 5.49 so again within one percent of each other and considering the multimeter for capacitance isn't hugely accurate either um, that's pretty close and then the final one of course the 1000 microfarad we got 1001 microfarad on the DMM and we got 1010 on the calculation now again that's a really long rise time so the two instruments are doing them slightly differently there but either way it's giving you a pretty close um, accuracy reading for all of these capacitors using a very simple setup and of course at the end of the day the pulses could be um, generated by simply using a um, piece of TTL logic or a microcontroller the key here is that you have a fast edge so that you get a really really good um, response time on your RC network that is not influenced by your input um, rise time so the faster that rise time the less impact it will have on your final readings uh, for the inductors though because we actually did a nice accurate measurement of the capacitance um, we were able to accurately or at least within the accuracy of the DMM um, calculate the inductance of the test components so this is not too bad at all I think that it's probably still within um, you know just a few percent on the inductance range because the capacitance if you can t trust the reading of maybe say one percent then you know because you're using the same test circuit uh, and stuff like that th and the frequency that you're measuring is usually quite accurate then there's no reason to think that the inductor values should not be within uh, one or two percent as well of the actual values so it's a very good example here of how to use a very basic setup um, to test some of the components and most multimeters have a capacitance range on them but very very few if any that I've seen have got an inductor uh, test capability and you know to, you can spend a few hundred bucks buying an inductance meter or something like that or building your own rig if you're uh, up for doing that as well um, but at the end of the day if you do happen to have a pulse generator or waveform generator that can generate fast wi wi fast rise times why would you you know go to that extra effort unless you specifically wanted to have one anyway so this is just another example of where the Agilent 33622A arbitrary waveform generator has uh, shown itself to be uh, even more useful on the lab bench or in the workshop um, you know we've already shown how it can be used to measure the length of cables for doing time domain reflectometry um, validating um, proper termination of transmission lines whether that is something that um, is a short piece of wire between two pieces of equipment or between a microcontroller and some kind of sensor or something that could be you know thousands of feet long between two different buildings or something like that with cat5 cable um, I mean as well as all of the awesome capabilities of the Agilent waveform generator this is just stretching its capabilities to other areas that some people wouldn't think really to try and use for something like this so you know um, I think at the end of the day it's going to be a very very useful uh, piece of kit around my lab that's for sure I will post all of the formulas that I've used um, the spreadsheet data here is already on the blog entry as I'm recording this so um, the only thing left I think to do is to uh, wrap up with a few 
uh, pictures for the schematics that I used for the testing and that will complete this blog. I hope you found it uh, educational and interesting and um, if you want to go out there and replicate this example yourself. As you can see, I don't have an expensive oscilloscope. Uh, I do have a really nice pulse generator, but you can replicate to a um, good enough degree of accuracy this same um, test scenario with even a, a simple piece of TTL logic generating the pulses or as I said, a microcontroller. Um, if you're really good, good at your programming, you could even have the microcontroller look at the reflections. Um, sorry, thinking of TDR again. You could have the microcontroller actually count the frequency of the ringing every time and actually come up with an inductance of its own. Um, if I get some time before the um, end of the review, what I may do is also try to use the um, resistor and inductor in parallel to figure out the L uh, inductance of. Um, the components or a capacitor um, in Henry's using the uh, impedance method which is where you basically change the frequency of your source signal until the component under test whether it be an inductor or a capacitor has the same amplitude on it as the resistors ampli amplitude so if you put 5 volt source signal out um, you would adjust the frequency until you have half a volt across the resistor, half a volt across the inductor uh, or capacitor and at that point because you now know um, the frequency and the in impedance of the component you should be able to also calculate the inductance so it would be an interesting exercise to add this to the blog to see if we actually get the same results so stay tuned for that one in the meantime I hope you enjoyed this